Wigs and you haven't trolled our YouTube page. My name is Krista Matulowitz. I am the Curator of Community and Academic Programs here at the Biggs Museum. Uh, so welcome. If you've never been to the Biggs Museum before, you found it. Thank you. Um, we are a three-story museum that specializes in decorative and fine arts of the Mid-Atlantic. Um, and so we have everything from rotating exhibitions here on the first floor to they were located inside an exhibition of student artwork um, where students adopted art from our collections and then their teachers created lesson plans and taught them. So we have everything from kindergarten through high school Spanish classes um, who do this program. On our second floor, we have our historic collection where you'll find a lot of our decorative arts, things like object-based art, chairs, furniture, um, a lot of silver. And then up on our third floor, we do presently have our Visions and Voices exhibition uh, that this is our winner from. And we'll be chatting more. Uh, and then that exhibition, Visions and Voices, is actually coming down this Saturday. Uh, so be sure to get up there and check it out. We also have our more modern and contemporary art exhibitions go up there as well. So let's start introducing everyone. Um, if You've never, actually, you probably never met her. <laughs> this yes. is our new curator. I'm relatively new. I started the museum in March. I'm Laura Gravel. I'm the Sulci Biggs Curator of American Art. And that was a lovely overview of the museum. And I will just add, if you haven't seen Visions and Voices yet, go see it. What have you been waiting for? <laughs> and our new exhibition, um, the Delaware Division of the Arts Award Winners Exhibition, opens June 3rd. So mark your calendars for the opening reception for that. <laughs> Yeah, and today we are joined by our Public Voice Purchase Prize winner from the Visions and Voices exhibition, Melissa Sutherland Moss. Hi. <laughs> yeah, thanks for joining us. So for any of you who don't know what the Public Voice Purchase Prize was, was from our Visions and Voices exhibition, which was a juried exhibition of Mid-Atlantic African-American artists. We had a separate jury come in and select five artworks from the exhibition that we felt would make sense adding to our collection. And then we left from those five artworks, we left it up to the public to choose uh, what they wanted added to our collection. And this was our winner, and that is our winning piece. <laughs> and so tonight we're gonna deep dive into why it's so special and why you're so special. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so since we're a small group tonight, as we're going, if the audience has any questions, feel free to join in. Um, we're small enough that it can be more of a conversation. Um, so let's jump into it. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what drew you to pursuing art as a career? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so my name is Melissa Sutherland Moss. I am born and raised from Brooklyn, New York. I am a multidisciplinary artist. My primary focus is collage, but I work in various mediums like photography, Polaroid, um, digital work sometimes. Um, installations recently. I love doing installations. Um, self portraits is also a new thing for me. Lots of self development. So you'll see a lot of like self work within my bodies of work. Um, I chose art as a career, or rather, it chose me, perhaps. I would say it chose me. Um, it wasn't, I feel like it, it wasn't something that I just selected. It was more so I felt the need to. It felt like a God-given talent that I just had to live through. Um, and it, it's just something that I couldn't live without. And I feel like I just had to sort of make it a part of my everyday life. So here I am pursuing that because I love it 
And did that start at like a young age? Sometimes artists come in, they're like, oh, from from like preschool, I was creating things, or was it like a, a moment later in life where you're like, this is. Yeah, I have always been a creative from, I think my mom always knew that from when I was a child. And so she always like introduced me to a lot of different creative venues. Like first I was in uh, tap dance, ballet, piano. I did all the things. And then my godmother was like, oh, there's a program called AXO, which is like a city, it's an urban um, community where they compete in different categories. And so we would do workshops every Saturday. And then once I got into that program, it just stuck. And so I was like about in middle school, going into high school into that program. And ever since then, just art has always been my life. Yeah. Uh, and again, when you talked a little bit about different media and how you span so many different things from installations to self-portraits to collage, but especially collage. And I'm curious what drew you to that and what keeps bringing you back to that? Yeah, so that's actually a really good question because I have my BA in painting, oil painting. So by trade, I am an oil painter and I love oil. Um, I don't oil paint anymore. I'm not, <clears throat> I don't dive into painting because when I left school, I didn't have the proper ventilation for oil and it's very toxic. You need certain sinks and <laughs> all the things, right? And I'm a very like eco, I like to keep things safe and clean. So I just couldn't paint at home. I didn't have the funds for a studio. And so I looked into an alternative, which was acrylic, but I didn't love acrylic. It just didn't give me the same feeling as oil did, right? And so I'm like, I gotta find something else. And so I started playing with like magazines and adding mag magazines into my acrylic pieces and jewelry. And I really loved it. I love the flexibility. I love the texture. I just love the, the freeness of using different materials. And I loved it so much more than painting. And so it became excessive until it was all collage and no paint. And I stopped using paint for a very long time. And I realized that after a while. And so now I call myself a collagist because it's more collage and less paint. Um, and so that's how I got into collage, trying to find something that would excite me as much as oil did, and it's collage. Now, when you make collages, um, do you have specific resources you look for imagery from, um, or do you just kind of find things you like and keep them? Yeah. What's your process? Yeah, I think that's a that's a really good question. I think mm -hmm. because when artists are creating, they're more so drawn to things that catch their eye. And uh, and that's how you are when you're shopping or if you're looking for furniture or whatever, you're just drawn to things that catch your eye. And so that's how I am. I'm very drawn to nature, so I collect a lot of flowers. I collect um, black women, like I cut them out and I save them. So um, I also collect a lot of things that uh, represent movement. So like cars and trains or things that sort of look like they're vibrating because I like to incorporate uh, movement into my pieces somehow. Um, and so I am attracted to a lot of the same things. So as I'm collecting and I go back to look at things, I'm like, you know, I can just categorize things because they're all the same. So that's how I collect things. And then I just organize them in folders. Mm. I was definitely gonna ask that. I was gonna be like, are they? Are, do you just have like a drawer of file folders? Yeah, you no. Know, collage is very messy, right? Collage is extremely messy, and so I realized after, and people donate a lot of magazines to me, mm -hmm. and so after a while, I have piles and piles of things. So I cut, I created a binder, sort of like what you have in the front, and then I put plastic folders in the binder, and in each folder, it's different, like flowers. Uh, city-like stuff so I'll label all of the folders and so when I'm collaging and I'm thinking of something and I'm like oh I need a skyline I'll have a folder that has a city <laughs> skyline I'll go into my skyline folder um, and so that's sort of how like so now it's very easy for me to collage because everything is organized before it was just kind of like I'm just scrambling finding things um, but now it's a lot more organized and collaging is like super seamless. <laughs> I love that. I sound like your sister, but from a different life. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I just, I'm 
wondering about um, the pictures and everything. Um, is there any problem with copywriting or any of that? If, if you find a picture in a magazine, how does that affect your work? Yeah, so I've actually looked into that a lot. And I've read so many articles um, and I've seen something that says if you cut something out and then just create a whole new image from it, then it becomes a brand new image. Okay. But I also do think there's some thin lines with that. Yeah. And so you have to like be careful. extremely careful with that. Okay. Yeah. I will say I've read up on that too and I think it's, it's murky as well that very I would murky. think that all of this is fair use. I know there's some big court case right now about a Warhol image where he did take the full photograph and do very little to transform it. So yeah. we'll see what happens with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so um, so these works were created between um, 2018 and 2020. So a lot of my collage works will have like full images from magazines, but now I incorporate a lot of the images that I take myself. So you'll see my work now Mr. changing Cosby. over time. I was about to ask if you use your <laughs> photography in these, yeah, um, and works. if you use contemporary magazines, or if people donate a wide variety of things that they find in storage units. Or yes, a <laughs> wide variety of tons of different magazines. Okay. Yeah. Any favorites? Life. No, I'm yeah. very good. I love Life. I love Life magazines. <laughs> I, I love vintage magazines, mostly because of the smell. <coughs> I enjoy the smell of vintage things. And so I, I just love flipping through. I'm a researcher as well. And so life magazines for me, they, it gives me so much education. So as I'm like searching for images, I spend lots of time like in one magazine. I'll be looking for one thing and then I'm 45 minutes in. And so, right, in one <laughs> magazine. And then I find a story. And then now I'm on the internet while I'm supposed to be searching for something. Um, so life is, is probably my favorite because of all of the, the stories. How about um, um, like um, thrift shops and stuff? You know, they might have yeah. magazines. You might find some old magazines in the thrift shop. Yeah, I have um, been searching thrift shops. But I also find that a lot of vintage magazines are expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're like $10 a magazine sometimes. Um, and so I just wait for people to donate magazines for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. For this particular work, um, it's my understanding that you embellished it a little after you first submitted it. So yes. I'm curious about <laughs> that process. And it's all the more fabulous because of it. Yeah, so actually I was very shocked that I saw that question. And I was like, <laughs> oh, they noticed that I embellished the piece. So I created the piece in 2020. Um, and when I submitted it to the museum and it got selected, I was like, oh, no, I need to jazz my baby up. Um, <laughs> usually whenever I have a piece that's going out somewhere, I usually either have a commencement, if I'm never going to see it again, I'll have a commencement where we sort of have a, like a critique session, I'll do my write-ups, blah, blah, blah. So for this one, when it was going out to the museum, I'm like, oh, I got to jazz it up, I got to like make it fresh. And I wanted to modify it a bit to reflect who I am now as an artist, and so I when I created it, it was who I was then, but even though it's a reoccurring theme for me, I just wanted to add a little bit more. So what I added to this was the flowers, the yellow flowers, the, the halo, the glitter <laughs> halo. <laughs> and that's pretty much about it. There's some trickled flowers throughout it to make it seem like a trail almost, and then the halo. Um, but it did make all the difference, and I was so happy with the modification. <laughs> yeah, I remember when this piece came in. Um, just so everyone knows, I kind of like assisted the jury, but I was not a jury person. Um, I was the point of contact for all of the artists entering the show. So I like compiled all of our pictures to show the jury and ran the jury session. Um, and one of the other staff members was on the jury. It was one of our, one of, one member from our staff was like the museum representative. And when the piece came and we saw it, we both were like, oh, oh, 
oh, this is different. I love this. Like, how did it go? immediately? I was like, how did I not see the glitter? Um, <laughs> and then you look back I, and yeah, like, I looked back and I was like, this is because I, I what I remember was like that Nimbus piece was also a little more just the shape. It didn't have the little points coming off it in my mind. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I was, when it came, both me and that staff member were like. Oh, <laughs> it's amazing. I finally got glitter in the museum. <laughs> it's taken years. All right. Oh, I was happy yeah. that you liked the modification. Yeah. I loved it too. Yeah, it was, um, it, it's funny actually, when the second jury came through and we were looking at which pieces were going to be like the five representatives, it was a split between those two. Was it? It was for like, we're like, okay, well, it can't be just two from the same artist, <laughs> two from the same artist when there's only five. Um, and the person who cast the final vote said glitter. <laughs> wow, glitter made and they, the cut. Yeah, and that, that was- so interesting. That was the big change. Um, Cause it just seemed so, the glitter really did make it seem so much more relatable in a way um and i can just kind of speak to some of the conversations that that second jury was having um and they were talking about this other piece and very much how it reminded them of like venus and the venus statues and paintings and like very botticelli and this one with her being in a business suit with the glitter, they're like, this just seems so much more now. Contemporary. Yeah, they're like, this is very art historical and this is just very contemporary and people relate to it. And yeah, the glitter. The, the glitter, glitter was the vote. The glitter. <laughs> Glad I added the glitter. I haven't heard those stories before, but that's actually a good lead into our next question. Oh, oh no, I was just going to say so I, I also think, though, that the glitter, while it makes it contemporary, I see that as a connection back to almost like Renaissance paintings and when you would see women and you know saints and um, and you know things like that with this beautiful halo behind oh, them yeah. right mm -hmm. so I think that for as modern as and contemporary as the glitter makes it I think that it also grounds that to a certain degree in some of that historical reference yeah. At least that was my interpretation when I looked at it, to bring that sense of reality to it and, and that connection to the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you also think of the um, iconic um, Russian um, saints and all mm -hmm. with the halo and the, and the dark skin is very, very important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yep. Can I, um, installation, what about installation? So the installations that I do are more so, um, I have like a bunch of materials like um, drapery and fabric. My mother is very into like curtains and vintage, um, like crocheted like curtains. And so I collect a lot of fabric and then I install them and add like greenery and then I'll take myself portraits or I'll ph photograph other individuals inside of the setup. What did they call it? Uh, they, they have a name for that. Um, like setting everything up. Like how you style your house to get it sold. Yeah, yeah. or staging. Um, a staging. 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 Yes. 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 Like a um, set design almost. Yes, yes. but there's some, they, they, they also call it something. You know, like when you're triplo, troplo, triplo, when you're setting up pictures and houses and different things. Tableau. Tableau. Yeah. Thank you. That's what, that's what that reminds me. Got it. Yeah. I did that that was part of your practice, and I love the idea of kind of stepping into that world and having it all around you. Yeah, so I'm actually, um, I got accepted to uh, MICA in Baltimore. Congratulations. And thank you. And so I'll be really incorporating all of the mediums a lot more, so you'll see a lot of the other disciplines. So are you? What's that? I'm sorry. Uh, museum as well. Yeah. Uh, Maryland Institute College of Art. Oh. So I'll be starting my Master of Fine Arts this summer. Okay. 
Okay. You move closer to us. <laughs> so it's a hybrid program, yeah. and so I'll be back and forth. But I'll spend my entire summer in Baltimore. Yeah. Um, where did you go to school? Where did you um, do your um, art? I did study? at Southern Connecticut State University in New Haven, Connecticut. Oh, wow. I love talking to you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> We're from New York, so <laughs> I used to work at Cooper Hewitt, not that far from New Jersey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. talk a little about what we see in your work, but I'm curious to hear what inspires you and what you were thinking about when you put this together. Yeah, um, I think during this time, I did a lot of work that was centered around Black women. Um, and that was the time that I was really into like a self-discovery. And so my work is a reflection of you know, African women, Caribbean women across the diaspora. So it's many different stories, not just my own, right? And so when you're learning as a black woman, you're learning from history and ancestors and mothers and grandmothers and aunts and sisters and friends. And, and so all of the work is not only just about me, it's about, you know, many women that I've crossed paths with. Um, and so they tell stories of, you know, many different stories across the diaspora. Um, and so that's really like my inspiration when I'm creating work. But my work now though, it, it's still centered around black women, um, but, the, but the focus is a little different. I'm still creating in collage, but you'll see like my newer work is a lot different. Still centered around, um, so it's not only about black women in the North, it's just about African Americans and the Caribbean diaspora. Um, so still motivated, motivated and inspired by black women, but you know, it looks a lot different. This body of work is just me discovering myself and then telling stories of other African American Caribbean women. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> very nice, very nice. Thank you. So when you were creating this piece, was there anything that like, did you have already a plan in mind when you were creating it? Or did you kind of come across a piece and you're like this and just kind of run, did it come organically? Yeah, so I found a book of trains. Um, I think I was walking past bed -Stuy. I don't know if you guys have ever been to Brooklyn, but in the summertime in Brooklyn, a lot of people in bed -Stuy leave books out on their front stoop or just like things that they on don't the want. Bench, yes. Yeah, yes. on the bench. Mm -hmm. And I love walking around that side because I'm a collagenist and people leave books and I love to find things. I found this book of trains and I was so attracted to it because I love trains, I love the movement. And again, I like to collect things that uh, for me signify movement and transition and growth. And so I use certain items to talk about certain things I found a book of amazing trains. And so I started to cut them out and collect them. And so that's how you'll see a few of my pieces have like mm -hmm. this sort of like travel theme, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the, this black woman traveling and, and growing and the flowers represent growth and learning. And, um, and so that's kind of how it starts, right? I'll see something that I love. It could be anything. It could be a a city line, right? And I see this and I'm like, ooh, what can I pair with it? So that's sort of how it starts. Okay, I see. You know, it's not like the other way around where I'm like, okay, I want to collage a black woman standing with trains. And now I'm on the hunt for <laughs> trains. Like that seems a bit chaotic, right? I usually like, I'm flipping through something and something catches my eye and then I create that way. So it, it usually like moves through me and not so more me thinking beforehand to create it. It comes to me, and then it just moves through me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's interesting to hear too, because I know when I was looking at your work, I assumed that you started with the figure first and then built a world around that figure and kind of imagined their setting. But to start with sort of fabulous book of trains, which in particular piece that inspires you, and then to do iterations from that and to yeah. build that out. Yeah, to, I imagine people think that I start that way too, because I have tons of cutouts of women, like tons of cutouts um and so it's hard for me to decide because they come in different sizes and shapes and perspectives and angles 
So when you're collaging, you'll see that sometimes perspectives look a little different when you're collaging them together. Um, so usually I don't start that way because if I do, then I spend too much time thinking about items that will match this image. And it just takes too much time. I'd rather just start the other way around and just select things as it moves through me. Questions about that? <laughs> I, think, I think in my artwork, I, I think of the person first and what I want her to be doing and what I want her to, to, to bring and meet. And when she meets somebody else, what would they be saying? It's usually a man asking her a question. <laughs> and so I do it a little differently. But I'm, I'm um, a quilter. So I, like you, gravitate things from the magazine. I do it from material. Mm. The material speaks to me. So I listen to the material and I see something in the material. And that's like, should you go do this? Yes. <laughs> And then I, oh no, I am, no, I do do it like yeah. that. Then I bring the woman yeah. in. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, it's, it's strange. And when you're by yourself, you don't have anyone to converse with, to bounce the ideas off mm -hmm. so that you can get their perspective of what's going on. Or Love yeah. my man dearly, but you no, know, he doesn't, you know. Yeah. We don't speak that kind of language. But he's an artist in his own, own right, too. He does jewelry. Oh, nice. Nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, All right. love it. Now, speaking about how this kind of forms organically, do you ever come across you've built your collage, and at the end you just go, no, this is not it? And, like, what do you do? Actually, <laughs> I have a really good story for you. Okay, <laughs> this piece went under surgery like three times, and I actually have all the footage on my Instagram. When I started this piece, so this piece went under, it's been, it's been modified at least like two or three times. The first time I did it, I was like, no. It just felt, it felt very flat. It didn't really have much dimension, but I let it sit for a while. And then I brought it into, sur into surgery, and I say surgery because I literally cut it apart mm. <laughs> and start over. And so what I did was I cut within the mountains, and then I, I'll show you. So I cut within the mountain here, and I added this uh, building structure. And I loved it because in the magazine, it looked like it was wrapping around something. So when I cut it and put it in here, it just, yeah. it's just perfect. It's it seamless, right? It almost looks like it was supposed to be there. And so that piece got cut out. This piece was sliced here to add this crowd with the building structure. Um, this piece was uh, added here. So I did a lot of cutting here. So I cut this train out to add uh, some collage pieces in here. So there are times where I'm just like, no, this is not working for me. And then I'll go in, slice it up, and then add in what I think would look good. So yeah, that happens a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, it just, it seems so precarious working with paper and found images. Yeah, it is very delicate, very, very delicate, which is why I I feel like I've been called to work in collage is that I'm a very impatient person, especially when it comes to art. Like, I, I just want the result. I want to see the final picture. And for years, I've always prayed for patience. And I think it came in the form of collage, honestly, because you have to have patience to cut with an exacto knife because depending on your pressure, you can rip the magazine, the magazine paper is like, yeah. you know, right. <laughs> <laughs> and so you have to do it right because sometimes you can't save it, right? And if you do save it, you have to be like very skilled in saving magazine paper because sometimes the oils from your your fingers, it's just very complicated. Um, and so you have to be extremely patient with collage and. I 
love collage so much. And I just can't believe how much patience I have grown for this medium. Yeah. <laughs> I've got another question. Whenever I've done anything of sticking one thing onto another thing, there's always an issue with this, whatever I'm using to do the sticking, that it's bumpy or this or that and that. What do you recommend if you're going to try doing something like that to do? In terms of glue? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, there's several glues that I use for different things depending on the weight and texture of the paper. Okay. If it's a very lightweight paper or magazine, I use glue sticks because oh, yeah. when you put heavier, like a wettish type of glue on paper, it absorbs the paper and it'll start to like do its thing. Like, it'll start to do this. And while that's fun, I particularly don't love it in certain pieces. You know. Right, and so I'll use like an um, archival glue stick, oh, okay. and I'll use that on magazine paper, and then stick it down really quickly, and maybe put like a book on top of it so it stays flat. Okay. And then I'll let it sit, but you have to check on it sometimes because if the if the glue stick mm -hmm. smudges out and it's you put something on top, it'll stick, and then when you lift it off, the color of the magazine will rip off. You can't save that. No. Um, you can buy if you, so sometimes that happens to me. If a magazine rips off, I'll either try to mix acrylic paint very closely to the color, mm -hmm. or I'll try to make the mistake into something fun and I'll just, like this sky right here is multiple different shades of blue. It's not all from the same magazine. So let's just say you make a mistake with collage, you just find another piece of paper and just glue it on top. It looks like it's Okay. Um, <laughs> so for heavier papers, I would use either Mod Podge glue or um, a combination of things. Sometimes I use paintbrush to add the glue. I'll use my finger so that the paper doesn't absorb too much and wrinkle. Um, I am an author, and whenever I'm thinking of coming to a conclusion of my book, I'm not, I never feel like I'm done. So how do you know, like especially working with collage, and there's so many different elements to it, like how do you, what do you tell yourself? Like, okay, I'm done, this is, this is mm -hmm. it. because <laughs> I never really thought about that as much because sometimes when I feel like something is done I see something else I see something else right but also to I have also learned to put things down mm -hmm. and I have to like teach myself that I'll put things down or I'll put it away or I'll set it aside and keep it in plain sight for me to see but it's away like we need space and then I'll figure out, if I don't feel like there needs to be any change, then I'll let it be. But I don't know, I just get the feeling sometimes that things are done. But, but the other one, when you realize that she had to make some changes, what were you feeling then? That thing? It felt flat. Mm -hmm. It was missing dimension for me, like foreground, middle ground, background. Um, it just felt too flat and I wanted to see more dimension, more depth to it. So that's why I felt like that one needed to be modified. It was just way too flat. Thank you. Yeah, I think that was a good question. <laughs> Speaking of dimension, as I'm sitting here, I can see a slight shadow under the bottom the collage and I'm curious how the elements are attached to that backing paper. Um, in part I ask this because in our 19th century collection in the still life it was popular to say put grapes on a nail on the wall and then pull them out to get those interesting shadows behind them and that mm -hmm. added to the value of the work that's in a lot of artists minds in the same period. And I'm curious if you're working on these elements and then putting them on a backing board if you're using the backing board throughout the process 
It was shaped. It was that shaped. is such a good question. <laughs> Let me tell you why. Because when I first started collaging, I used to collage directly on the backing. But I find that to be challenging because when I'm in my indecisive mode and I want to pull things up, it's very difficult to pull up paper that's on a backing. And so now I just collage in thin air. Freeform. I freeform collage itself and then so the, it lives. I can pull this off if I want to. So it lives just like that. And it's a very hard way to collage. It's not collage. <laughs> <laughs> There's a new form of quilting that's called collage. Mm -hmm. And they do that, same thing you're talking about with, um, okay, when you're, when you're baking, you put this paper down on the um, baking sheet, it's called what? What is it called? Parchment. 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 Right. It's been when a long you day. do something with <laughs> parchment, right. you can put it all around and do whatever, and if you don't like what it looks, Pull that right up yep. off the parchment, and then when you do like it, you can put it back yep. down. That's so exactly how exactly I collage. The same thing. Yeah, that's how I collage. So mm -hmm. usually I'll set it out on something flat, and then I'll collect all of my pieces and rearrange all the things. And then when I'm ready to glue down, then I glue everything one that's piece at a time. At a time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So it's all, so I can shift it on anything that I want to put it on. Like I can take this and put it on the wall or I can put it on a six feet piece of paper. I can add to it. I don't usually commit to a backing because I never know what I want the backing to look like. <laughs> now you talked a little bit earlier on about sort of how your work has shifted, changing focus, that you kind of change what media you're using. Now, both of these collages that you um, submitted were, they're roughly the same size, both the collage itself and the frame. Um, is this typically the size you work in? Do you do larger scale, smaller scale? Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> during those years, this was the biggest that I've gotten with these types of collages. But now I'm working a lot larger. I have, I'm working on a piece right now that's six feet by five wow. feet. Wow, that's a lot. Uh, because mm -hmm. I just recently got a studio and studio space makes all the difference mm -hmm. when you are creating work. Like literally all the difference. If you're creating at home, it's very hard. So you try, you, you create small, but when you have space and you know, you, you get an opportunity to scale up. Mm -hmm. um, and so I scaled up a little bit but this was me in my safe zone. Um, but now I'm uh, <coughs> scaling up a lot larger because I have the space to do so. Um, and that, you know, that takes different resources like collecting <coughs> or printing larger. So now that you can, you know, put things up on a wall. Um, but yeah, two years ago, this was my safe space. But I've been creating a lot larger now. Mm -hmm. I know these were created in 2020, if you don't mind my asking, is that during the pandemic and does that affect mm -hmm. your practice at all? Um, it didn't really affect my practice at all, but it was during the pandemic when I was creating these pieces. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> I'm curious too to hear more about your space while you're working. At the beginning you mentioned the binders with different collage elements filed away carefully, um, but what is, are you like when you're in the zone? Is there music playing? Do you have sound in the background? Do you need absolute <laughs> silence? What is that creative process? So, lots of different things, right? My process is very interesting. Like I usually come in super early in the morning maybe like around 7.30, I'll have my coffee, I'll do my ritual things, I write a lot. So I need about an hour or so before I work, because, and I usually carve that out strategically <laughs> because I know myself, I need an hour to BS before I work. I need to get it all out. Um, and then when I get it all out, I'll play music, but it really depends on my mood at the time. Like I could be playing Ari Lennox or I'm playing jazz or I'm playing 
hip hop or reggae. It really depends on my mood, but usually when I'm when I start my music and I get into my zone, like I am in mm. my zone. It could be hours, like I didn't eat, I didn't use the bathroom, and I'm like, oh my god, six hours has gone by. So that's usually like my process. When I'm deep into like a series of work, I can spend like 12 hours collaging per day. Yeah. Do you go to bed early? Or? Now I do. I'm in bed by like 8.30. <laughs> I know, yeah. but I'm up by six ish to get into the studio by seven ish, eight thirty ish. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I just wanted to comment. I worked in Baltimore for a number of years, and Micah isn't too far from the train station. So, <laughs> and they, they have other um, motorized vehicle things. What do they call those? Bill, they were like a train, but they trolley. Yeah. No, it was a trolley. I forgot. But anyway, there's all kinds of that going around there. So you might find that stimulating. Yeah. And it's in a historic building, the train station. Yes, they mentioned that. I didn't get a chance to check it out, but I, they did mention a lot of the classrooms are located in. Um, What's the word that I'm looking for? Not refurbished, but like historic buildings that have been renovated. Yeah. Yes, historic uh, historic train stations that have been renovated and they use them for classrooms. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah, they had uh, yeah. black paint on the. They have a big dome kind of thing. They painted black during World War Two, I think, mm. and it stayed that way for a long time. But I think they went in there and, and changed, it. changed it. Yeah. yeah. But then, then you can go back and forth from there to New York City. Yep. Mm -hmm. Won't take long. Yep. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you mentioned that has a nice um, showing in a museum. Oh yes, they do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have a question. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, you mentioned that you are that you also work with photography and Polaroid. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious to hear a little bit more about, like, I'd love to hear more about Polaroid and, and the way that that plays in. So I'm a, I'm an educator and as a, as an elementary classroom teacher, I used, I had wonderful Polaroid projects that I did with my own students. And I'm curious about that. Yeah. So I have two current Polaroid uh, series that I'm working on right now. The first one is with Barbie and let me, Excuse me for not introducing my Barbie. I was, I was, <laughs> <gonna ask. laughs> I was the question. <laughs> Excuse me for not introducing my Barbie, but Barbie is part of like a social engagement where I take her out in real life settings and I photograph her in places and then I write reviews in Barbie's name. So I write tons of Google reviews in Barbie's name. I take photographs, I upload the photos. And then I also am working on NFT series, and my NFTs are actual real Polaroids of Barbie that I scan and upload as NFTs. And so I carry around my Polaroid. NFT. So an NFT is a non-fungible token. It's like a digitized, who oh, is a complicated thing, but it's a digitized artwork that you can add upload to a digital wallet and people can purchase your digital work. Mm. It's mm. kind of like digital artwork that comes with its own certificate of authenticity. Yes. So there's only one unique one that can be purchased and people can can trade it. Trade it and, yeah. yeah. And it's almost like that mm -hmm. Barbie where people used to take a flat rendition of something and take photographs of when they travel around the world. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're doing it with Barbie. I do it with Barbie. Oh. And then the other series is I do a lot of portraits of people in light. And so I have a project called Find Your Light and I usually photograph. The Polaroid captures light so beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do portraits of people um, in rays of light. Mm -hmm. And so I have some of that on my website as well. It's really beautiful. You gotta show us your Barbies. So here's one. Oh, there she is. 
I didn't purchase her like this. Um, she came in her own outfit, but I added some like hair jewelry. Mm -hmm. um, this is what some, this is what I used to wear in my hair when I had hair. Mm -hmm. But basically it's like hair jewelry. I love jewelry. I love to like jazz up. Um, and so I added this jewelry on her and here she is. And so I take pictures of her like, boop, uploaded on Google. Oh, the Bates Museum is amazing. You have to check it out. <laughs> oh, Barbie's like, duh. So that's what I do. That's it's cute. a lot of fun. It gets a lot of reviews and it's entertaining. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is it always that Barbie or you have several it's different ones? Several. So I have like, a, like about 40 dolls. And depending on the occasion, I'll bring out a different doll. So this is my Basquiat doll. And I usually take her to museums and artist talks and galleries because she just looks like she's ready yeah. for, you looks know. Like she stood too long and got graffiti. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I have different Barbies for different occasions. Have you had crossover yet where you have images of the Barbies in the collages? Not yet, right? But the new <laughs> body of work, um, my new NFT, NFT, my new NFT series is about um, Black Barbie and Black sustainability and environmentalism. And so mm -hmm. I have Barbies that come with like gardening materials. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a collage and add it into like a real garden with her play garden and sort of it'll be collage play stuff plus real garden all in one photograph so you'll see like different mediums and i have to figure out how i'm gonna mm. do this but that's <laughs> what it's gonna be <laughs> yeah really cool. oh, okay. yeah there's some community gardens in baltimore too mm -hmm. in the in the different uh, communities so yeah, that I'm might be a good resource or Background. And then there's fans, you know, formal gardens and stuff like that. It's all very different. But yeah, yeah, there's this one garden in in Baltimore called the Blue Light Blue Light Junction Garden, and they grow their own plants mm -hmm. and use the plant to create dyes. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very interested in that because I've been um, printing lately. I do a lot of like mono printing and screen printing, and so I create my own like pigments to create my like mono print so i'm i'm really excited about that uh garden i'd love to like grow my own plants to create my own pigments i think that's really cool you might also find the uh, b and o railroad museum a good place for Barbie oh, yeah. to look around oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's inside and outside so you've got lots of opportunities <laughs> yeah i'll definitely look into that yeah. So I have, we, we're coming down to like the last couple of minutes. I do have one more question. Uh, since you do so much different type of media work, do you find yourself going for like periods of time where you're doing just collage and then installation or do you kind of mix it up? Yes. I do. <laughs> That's also a good question. You know, because art moves through me, I don't usually decide. The art decides for me, right? So it really depends on, I guess, the mood that I'm in, right? If I'm, if I see something that I need to capture right in the moment, that probably calls for my Polaroid. It really depends on, you know, what's really calling me at the time. Um, but I do have some times where it's just Polaroid or it's just collage. I think oftentimes I'm like mixing and matching all the time, um, but primarily it's it's collage. I work mostly with collage, and sometimes uh, you'll see like my Polaroids are mixed within my collage work. Um, and even though I'm working in different mediums, I merge them together. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That ties into my next question, which is um, about the title of your piece in between the two. That I know we've talked about all these themes of things merging and coming together and movement in your pieces, but I'm curious how you arrive at the titles. Yeah, I feel like once I was done with it, um, and I really, usually when you're creating, 
the story sort of builds as you're creating. So when you're done and you have the opportunity to sit back and dissect what you've actually created, um, you kind of get the chance to retell the story all over again. And I realized that it just seems like she was in between two worlds, like a transition from where she was from into a new city. Um, and it just seems like there was growth happening in the direction that she was walking in. And so I just put in between two worlds because it's a bit of wanting to keep your culture but still wanting to grow and opening yourself up to opportunity and just um, a possibility of growth. So that's where the title came from, in between, <laughs> in between two worlds. So just in between, it's, I didn't want to put in between two worlds because I think sometimes when you're obvious with the title, then people just, um, they just go with whatever they think you, I, I prefer people to create their own stories. Um, yeah. So that's where the title came from. Okay. Awesome. We have time for a couple of questions from the audience, if anyone still has any. It, in uh, Earlier you talked about focusing on, particularly in this series, on African-American women and women from the Caribbean diaspora. Um, and you specifically referenced the Caribbean. So I'm curious about the connection to that and so which parts of the Caribbean? Oh, that is a, such a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm heavily influenced by the Caribbean. My parents are Costa Rican, both of them, which is located in Central America. But the side of Costa Rica that they're from is, uh, they share the Caribbean Sea. So they're from Liman, and so that coast of Costa Rica is shared with the entire Caribbean Sea. So they're heavily influenced in the Caribbean by the foods that they eat mm -hmm. and the culture and the things that they wear. Um, I feel like when people think of Costa Rica, they have an image in mind and they don't normally think of black people, but there is a huge black population in Costa Rica that's heavily influenced by the Caribbean um, with cultures and foods. And so when I say uh, Caribbean, that's sort of like where it come from. I, I sort of identify with a lot like African American, Caribbean, Hispanic, all kinds of things. And so did they raise you as a Spanish speaker? No, so I don't speak Spanish. However, that's their first language. So they both speak Spanish. I understand it a little bit. Um, I am a dual citizen of the country, but I don't speak the language. You've been to Costa Rica? Yes, I usually go every year. Nice country. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm curious as to your plans after your experience in Baltimore. Where do you see yourself? Yeah. I honestly, <laughs> I see myself working professionally. Um, I do want to be a quite one of my goals was to be acquired, work to be acquired by a museum. So here I am. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do see myself working in public art, <clears throat> social engagement, um, and just being heavily in the arts. I do want to teach college. So that's one of my bigger goals, which is why I wanted to acquire the MFA. I'd love to teach at a college level. But really be in large institutions like the Guggenheim and the Met and all the places. All the places. And the Whitney. <laughs> Those are my dreams. We're honored to be your first up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. I can say you started here. Hi, <laughs> I'm excited about that. So yeah, so that's where I see my um, taking up space. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I do want to share one of the reasons we actually set this talk in this room is because the artworks in this room that you see on the walls are part of our art adoption program, uh, which is a program we run, many of you dropped a book list, um, which is a program we run with schools um, anywhere from preschool homeschool through colleges. 
um, all across different disciplines. They come in and they can select from five artworks each year that are up for adoption and they get replicated uh, versions of that artwork and then they actually create lesson plans to teach throughout the year about the artwork. And the reason we put this talk in this room is actually because uh, Melissa has nicely agreed to let us use her artwork for next year's exhibition. We were looking for a piece that was very like figural, narrative, story based. Um, and while we were looking at things, a discussion kind of came up with our new director and he was like, well, what about collage? Like that's so appropriate also for like schools because we work with a lot of um, Title I schools and they're like, this is a material that kids can get and can use and can really use to build their imagination and make the tie that the work they do can be a professional level, that the media is there, it's just the inspiration in the story. Um, so yeah, that's why we put it in this room. I love that because oftentimes when people ask me about what type of art I do, and I usually say collage, and the usually the response is, oh, like high school, remember when you used to like put yeah, all the things totally. together and like that, like collage like that, like high school collage, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, and then when they see it, they're like, wait a minute, <laughs> is this digital work? Usually when they see it online, is this digital? And I'm like, no, it's collage. collage. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. yeah, so that's interesting because yes, it is very accessible um, and easy to, you know, use and obtain, so that's exciting. Yeah, so we're excited to have you as part of our pieces. Um, but also I wanted to give you an opportunity. I see you brought stuff of your own. Share with us. I did. So I brought <laughs> some, some gifts for the audience. They're okay. just some um, postcards with, oh, um, they're all like custom with a uh, handle with care sign. Mm -hmm. So my 22 project, I'm working on a series called Handle with Care. And so Handle with Care has different segments, but Handle with Care really is talking about the urgency of archiving black art across the diaspora. So it's like an urgency of, you know, like making sure we're saving our photos. I have like 20,000 photos in my phone. If I lose my phone, these photos are gone. And so the urgency really is to archive these stories, like mm -hmm. archive, like this, I can't wait to frame it because, <laughs> you know, this is like a good reference, mm -hmm. you know, a, I'm just thinking about all the things that is contributing to history that students can use in the future and that it needs to be archived so that people can obtain it to use for a resource. And the archiving process I've learned is very tedious. Mm -hmm. Very tedious. <laughs> very, like archiving is very tedious. So um, Handle With Care is about archiving these black stories. When you say archiving, what do you mean? Yeah, so how would, do that? How would I do that, right? So <laughs> it's really, really hard. Um, I have so many Polaroids and images, so few a few hours per week, I'll upload these images either to the drive or I'll try to print them, scan them, date who they are, where they are, what cities they were taken in, who's in the photos. I found an al the reason why I'm so like adamant about this. I found a series of albums um, that my mom had, and I found these photographs, and I'm like, "Oh, mom, where was this? Where is this? Who is this?" And she's like, "I don't know." <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. "So now I have this urgency to write down who these people are, where they are, what who are these black people? Like these stories need to be saved so that you know they're used as references." So that's the whole. That's good. <laughs> I can't stop that. <laughs> Nobody's going to want the album, but what am I going to do with it? Well, that's why I was asking how would I archive them. I have a lot of them already in albums. Now to digitize I need, them. I need to digitize them. Yeah. I need to go back and write you know, who they, they are. are. It's yeah, tedious. I get what I 
talking about back from the 60s. Talking about archiving, the new museum in Washington would be could be involved in that because you know they that's what they're about. You know, the African American Museum that's been open for a while now, but you know those the Smithsonian and those places they're about. I mean the pure archiving. You know when they're in a a room with no you know a dust or whatever right. they they're very careful about all that. So maybe um, that might be something to explore. Yeah. See what they're doing. Thank you for that. I'll You're definitely welcome. look into that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I like what you said about archiving uh, very much because one of the things that my husband and I do is research uh, enslaved Africans who were artists, oh, yeah. and, okay. but yet they were enslaved. And so we have found some most fantastic people. How did you find time to paint or to become a potter? And you were living in that plantation environment. Mm -hmm. And so finding out how they did that is the excellent way. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we, we do and we present that at our events. I love that yeah. because that also reminds me of sustainability, of them using natural resources mm -hmm. to create. Mm -hmm. So I love that. I'd love to connect with you okay. about that afterwards. That's amazing. Sure. Yeah, but we have time for one more question if anyone has any. No? Okay. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and we are so excited to have your piece join our collection here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.